Yeah, thank you, Masha, and thank you, all of you, for coming. Um, I'll just give a little bit of context about the work. Um, seven years ago, I became very interested in historical erasure. Um, I became actually really obsessed with historical erasure. <laughs> and I started researching places connected with, um, yeah, well, places that are erased in the Balkans and doing sort of detective work um, finding locations of erased history that were built over and doing site-specific artwork there, mostly site-specific performance. Um, and yes, the work, uh, the large umbrella of the work is all about um, memory, post-memory, which is uh, learned and assimilated memory. Um, and what I'm really interested in is this consciousness of the presence of absence and how it is when you um, when you know a location where there's a certain contemporary reality and um, you know so maybe it's a basketball court or something and then when you learn of the history of okay it's built over this red Jewish cemetery or something like this the the moment when the consciousness of the presence of absence begins to dominate the experience there and this this moment was something that really gripped me and that i wanted to work with as an artist um, and so the project continued and over years <coughs> then i started to become more interested in these really extended uh, geographical spaces that contain trauma in some way um, that contain also something that is erased. Uh, so the, the last two performances of the project uh, were both dealing with extended geographical spaces, which I consider to be landscapes of trauma, and the last one, which is sort of like the masterpiece of the project, <laughs> is this one that we've uh, seen tonight. Um, so, to speak about running on empty, as you may have read, basically it deals with the history of the gas van. The gas van was a, a large van that was used as a mobile <coughs> gas chamber uh, for a period of about three months during the Holocaust in Serbia and in a few other places, like in Latvia and in Poland. It was used, but very rarely. Um, and it was really just a normal van, but they would change the pipe so that the carbon monoxide would go back uh, inside, of the, inside of the enclosed space and the people inside were exterminated. So it was run every day for a period of three months, um, two times per day, and exterminating mostly women and children. And I uh, found the historic route of the van, which is a distance of 15 kilometers, and this is what I run here. Um, and uh, at the end of the route, there was a mass grave. Um, and the route itself is something very, very sensitive because it goes really straight through the center of the city, the center of Belgrade, past also like the main train station. Uh, then it goes, well, now there's like an autobahn, it goes through this, and then it goes into the hills where there's villages outside of Belgrade. Uh, but it was always also historically a route that had a lot of witnesses, you know, it was always, it was always a congested part of the city. Um, and so with this, I'm, I'm using my body to reactivate uh, this, this historic route, which has been uh, forgotten. And the breath is very important in the work because it deals with the history of suffocation. Um, so I made the decision to run it and also to do no training for the run. So it's really like a shock to the body. And uh, because the breath is so important, then I wanted to <coughs> excuse me, have everything recorded as much as possible. So I had two microphones here recording the breath, and I had one microphone here, which was a, a special microphone to record the muscles, a contact microphone. And uh, I decided to work also with the aesthetic of all of these wires and devices and electronics instead of concealing this. I liked very much how it created an aesthetic that was sort of 
I don't know, I felt like it was a bit violent and it had a sort of brutality to it also. And so I emphasized the aesthetic. I think it makes the body look sort of robotic as well. Um, so this was the performance itself. It was 15 kilometers and it was about um, a little bit under two hours that I ran. Um, the way that it was filmed, I worked with a filmmaker from Romania, Mihai Andrei Le Leha. Um, and the, the way that it's shot is basically every step of the, of the project, also with production and post-production, is approached in a very conceptual manner. And the way that it's shot is uh, these very close uh, images, which is like the body, uh, the fragmentation of the body is important. Um, and uh, the very rough, uh, shaky camera and uh, constant movement, and also with this closeness, I wanted to create a feeling of claustrophobia. Uh, then with the editing, and Branka Pavlovich did the editing, and she's here tonight also, <laughs> and we decided to work with these three uh, different images, because actually there were three cameras, and it was shot with a motorbike and a car, and yeah, sometimes being out of the car also. Um, and in the beginning, the idea was to have the three cameras um, always going in real time and to have all of the footage from each of the cameras, which is why the images were appearing and disappearing. But then in the end, we didn't work with this so precisely and instead we just worked more um, <coughs> aesthetically and intuitively with the images appearing and disappearing at times that are completely unpredictable. It's underlying the idea of fragmentation um, and also, yes, that which is unpredictable, which is how memory and particularly traumatic memory function. And then with the sound, and uh, Drew Exil Discount did the sound design for the project, and he's also here. <laughs> um, and the sound, uh, he uses all of the, the sound from the two mics that were here and also from the contact microphone. Uh, and all of the sound that you hear <coughs> in this, although sometimes it sounds maybe very electronic or e even instrumental at some points or even extraterrestrial at some points, but all of this actually comes from my own body. And then he's working with it with uh, textures and distortion in different, in different ways. Um, and this is also done very conceptually because he's working with um, repetition, reverberation and distortion and manipulation in a way that mirrors memory and especially traumatic memory. And um, also this kind of the sense of coming in and out of different realities, you know, that there's a time when everything is very distorted and intense and uh, uncomfortable with the sound, and then there's a sense of relief coming into a different reality, but this reality is still actually very filtered and then, and it's always unpredictable. Um, so for me, all of these different layers with the performance itself, with the, with the imagery and with the sound, um, it is my hope that it comes together to really create a strong work. And it's my feeling that it is a strong work, actually, that it can be very impactful for promoting, sorry, not promoting, <laughs> no, provoking. <laughs> um, Yeah. But provoking thought and provoking awareness and questions and inquiry about these very pervasive global human topics actually of how does one deal with memory, how does one deal with traumatic memory, post-memory, and when I say this I'm talking about for the individual but also for the nation. You know, because actually one can look at historical erasure as a disassociation on a national level. This is how I've come to think of it, looking at it in, yeah, with the context of some psychology. Um, and also nations uh, do tend to historically erase and to, yeah, deny histories also when histories are with, with trauma, with violence, and with shame. And so I think that there's a huge parallel there between the individual and the nation, and yes, so.
this is what the work is about, and I'm looking forward to learning from you guys and hearing feedback. <laughs> Would you like to inter introduce yourself before you... Yes, okay. Yeah, my, my name is Luca Di Blasi. I know uh, Ilana for a while. And uh, I'm uh, uh, working in uh, Switzerland at the University of um, um, Bern. And I'm teaching philosophy there. Uh, philosophy of religion in particular. And I, I have um, now um, written a presentation um, because Actually, my, my English is not that good, and especially I, I don't have a practice for, for a while, so I prefer to, to write something, and I, I hope you forgive me for this. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, I would like to, to thank uh, Maz, Maja um, for the kind communication and the perfect organization of this event, and I also uh, thank, want to thank the hosting organi organization here, um, the, the Silpoint Spaces Berlin, um, I'm at the first time here, so I'm, I'm, so I'm glad to be here the first time and to, 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 to learn more about this institution. Um, a few months ago, I met Elana on the occasion of an exhibition. We discovered that we both had been dealing with similar questions, similar landscapes of trauma, and this evolved um, in the idea of this talk, or in the invitation of, to this talk, to this presentation. Initially, I planned to refer briefly to running on empty in order then to speak about my own ideas regarding this question I was concerned with, the traumatic and political dimensions of the so-called collective guilt. However, after I got the link to, the, to her film, I was more and more involved in it, so that now it is almost the opposite. I, I will be speaking mainly about her fascinating work and put aside most of the ideas I originally wanted to, to present. This is also a mistake in a certain sense because after she talked to you, you have now a certain idea of the artist, which is of course an authority, uh, a very authoritative voice. <laughs> but uh, I tried um, to give an interpretation somehow without any further information, so we didn't talk about the film uh, very much, actually almost nothing. So I. I watched the, the film as someone who knows basically nothing about it, um, um, beside the information of the, um, the short information you gave uh, already in, in advance. At first glance, uh, the work running on empty seems to show an somehow unusual jogger dressed in black, <laughs> strangely wired, and holding a big or a strange microphone in her hand running through unfamiliar urban and suburban surroundings. Already the often shaky pictures from the hand from a hand camera, however, the abrupt and unpredictable change between one or of the three screens, the contrast between the intimate close, closeness of the breathing and the visual distance and limited visibility of the runner, the uncomfortable traffic noise and other disturbing and not easily identifiable sounds, the abrupt interruptions of the video and at least once of the soundtrack, the vulnerability of the young woman in sometimes lonely and sometimes even desolate um, suburban areas, all this would in itself be sufficient to provoke not only many questions but also a constant subliminal suspense and unease. But all these different elements are intensified or amplified through the historical layer <coughs> that the work description evokes, the gas vans used by Nazi Germany in Romania in 1942 to kill mainly women and children and all the horrible association accompanying uh, this atrocity. In consequence, many dense and stressful associations emerge. The breathing in connection with the exhaust gases of the traffic, but even passing tramways recall the gas vents. Other contingent images and sounds gain a new sense, are tinged by traumatic dimension. This affects the very running of the artists, uh, artist as well. We try to understand it accordingly as a search for, for hidden traces 
of the past or as an attempt to run away, something also indicated by the title of the work. But those interpretations are hardly satisfying. I would claim since the run does hardly appear to be one or the other, so neither running away nor looking for something. It appears rather directlessness. At this point, the attentive viewer would probably have many questions, but much less convincing answers. Fortunately, there's another element that I haven't mentioned so far and that might help us the way forward, since it is, in my opinion, absolutely crucial for the work, like the sound, actually, in, in, by the way, the title. It is not only it not only supplements the complexity created by intertwining sensual, formal and historical elements with another dimension, the thematic polysemy of the connection between the signifiers running and empty enable us to restructure or reinterpret the whole work. What can empty mean here? First of all, the sub urban, very often suburban surroundings, are almost deserted, empty of people, as you say in German, mentioned there. More, rel uh, more relevantly, the space seems empty of any evident trace of what the viewer of running on empty assumes happened 75 years ago in this area. Especially, we don't see any tracks. <coughs> running on empty, in this regard, might suggest a failed search for traces, a productive failure, however, since it turns out that it is exactly this emptiness, or void, which is the reason why we tried so hard to find those traces. So, so that finally we found them almost everywhere, even in the south, I think. But as already suggested, while the viewer of the work might be searching for such traces everywhere, the artist obviously is not. So what, what is the artist doing here? This question les, les, leads us to another, presumably more relevant meaning of the connection of the signifiers running and empty. <coughs> running on empty can mean complete physical and psychic exhaustion, what in connection with the historical layer to which the work description refers to, suggests an endpoint with all its horrible associations. And also, I mean, in the end, I think that you don't listen to the prayers anymore. So this is uh, one of these uh, associations. Only in the, in the very end, it comes back. No? You don't listen to the what? Anymore? The, the, the breeze. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, sorry. <laughs> Running on empty appears in this light as a reproduction of something traumatic, but not by an, a reenactment of a historical situation and neither by an accurate documentation or field study, but simply by acting it out. And this is exactly Freud's earliest definition of repetition compulsion. I quote Freud, the patient does not remember anything of what he has forgotten and repressed, but acts it out. He reproduces it not as a memory, but as an action. However, there's a relevant difference here. Freud added that the patient repeats something, I quote again, without, of course, knowing that he is repeating it. And this is clearly not the case here. The artist of, is, of course, knowing what she's doing. On this basis, and relating this aspect with the emptiness of memories in those places, of science of memories in these places, one might be tempted to speak of a paradoxical substitutionary repetition compulsion and acting out of something that is neither remembered nor even reproduced by action. But there is an almost oppos opposed possibility to connect running and empty with a runner and which the work description also suggests namely, running to empty out. This possibility might be associated with a mental or emotional processing in the sense of to free oneself from oppressing memories. 
This interpretation seems somehow to correspond to the physical act of running and the exhaust and exhaustion of the artist in the end. But in the specific space, but is the specific space where this kind of running to empty out occurs, is this respect a, a wisely choice? If the aim of the run is to is a sort of liberating practice why performing it exactly where what has to be overcome is evoked. Now the power of Elana's work seems to lie exactly in the connection of these two opposed dimensions. The work seems to fulfill a potentially, poten potentially liberating practice, a processing and overcoming of something traumatic exactly in the space where it is transformed into a form of, of substitutionary repetition compulsion and vice versa. Something that resembles a repetition compulsion is connected to a potentially liberating exhaustion. But I'm still not satisfied with this interpretation. The artist, after all, is neither driven by repetition compulsion, as already said before, nor does she seem to be liberated in the end. She's exhausted, yes but not in another way as a jogger would be after running a long period of time. I would therefore suggest that we have to make a last step in order to discover another and perhaps most important layer, and I would like to approach it by taking distance for a moment from Elana's work and making a detour, the detour through Germany's post-Holocaust commemorative culture. In the literature, different phases of are normally distinguished. The first one, one, lasting until around 1960 or so, is referred to a period of what is called collective communi communicative refusing to mention the Shoah. In German, communicatives beschweigen, as the philosopher Hermann Lübe called this practice. Beginning with the Holocaust processes in the early 60s and the Eichmann process, and against constant attempts to finally come to an end with the past, to draw a clean break, <coughs> it was then achieved and established a new consensus about the importance of working through the traumatic past. An emotional coping, a liberation from the burden of the past could only be possible by consciously working through it, through the, co the so-called German guilt. Such an understanding could somehow refer to Freud, who in the same text from which I already quoted the passage, remembering, repeating and working through from 1914, elaborated the first time not only the notion of the compulsion to repeat, but also the possibility to overcoming it by, of overcoming it by working through the resistance as well. Starting in the mid-80s or so, this model was gradually replaced by another one that might last until now and that is often referred to as Vergangenheitsbewahrung, the preservation of memory. This might be described as a conservative turn insofar as memory or the past does appear not so much as something that should be repressed, forgotten or overcome by working through its traumatic aspects, but that should be preserved. This change can be associated with a sentence of the legendary founder of Hasidic Judaism, Baal Shem Tov, and I quote, in remembrance lies the secret to redemption. This was a key sentence of a famous speech by the former German president Richard von Weizsäcker in 1985, this speech that ushered in the new, few, uh, new phase of preservation of the past. Here, two conflicting dimensions of Ilana's work I was mentioning before, a sort of repetition compulsion of the past and an attempt of liberation from the same past seem to reappear um, in a new form and not only interconnected but even reconciled. What appeared to be an oppressing compulsion the compulsion to remember, the obstacle for a liberation, turns out to be the liberating practice itself. 
philosophically speaking, the contradiction is resolved not by a thought, a higher synthesis, but by a new interpretation, an affirmation of remembrance of what seemed to be the opposite of liberation. My sense now is that this solution is too smooth in relation um, to Elena's work as well as in relation to Germans, Germany's practice of commemoration and the underlying problem can be addressed by referring to the notion of collective guilt. Against some historians who claim that the topos of, of collective guilt was a paranoid projection of right-wing extremists, Alida Asman, who is one major expert in the investigation of Germany's collective memory after 1945, claimed almost 20 years ago that the persistence of this topos in Germany's collective memory can be explained by the fact that it was based on a real historical experience the confrontation of the Germans with pictures taken from the liberated concentration camps within the re-education re campaign of 1945. The pictures were inscribed with the words, this is your guilt. And since this happened under the watchful eyes of a global public, Asman speaks also of a collective shame. This accusation of a collective guilt has been overcome according to Asman, by an internalization into the form, this is our guilt. By this internalization, which of course didn't occur immediately but lasted for decades, the trauma of collective guilt, uh, the word of, of uh, Asman, was, was resolved and became part of the political self-determination of the German nation. If we now relate this to what was said earlier, we can assume that this overcoming of the accusation of collective guilt by internalizing it was the very condition of possibility of the ongoing preservation of memory. Germany could give up the idea of overcoming the traumatic memories exactly in the very moment when it overcame its traumatic dimension through internalization. This would explain why the outlook of a never-ending commemoration, commem commemoration could become acceptable and advance to the consensual way of dealing with the past in Germany. But if this is the case, the following question arises. What distinguishes an eternal remembrance from an empty ritual? Disconnected from the idea of coping from running it out, since the trauma was allegedly overcome by internalization, what prevents this practice of commemoration to become an empty ritual? Shall we assume that this is what the work wants to criticize, your work? After all, the runner was neither looking for something nor fleeing something. She didn't find anything and nothing really happened <laughs> during and after the run besides the fact that she was physically a little bit exhausted. Her running, in this sense, was running empty. But, I, but um, I don't think that this is a satisfying interpretation, given the charged associ associations the work is able to provide. And so I come, if, if we connect both aspects, the running empty of the artist and the loaded associations it brings out, we might reach a more satisfying interpretation. According to it, and with this I shall conclude, running on empty works exactly on two different levels, but not the ones mentioned earlier, a traumatic one of compulsion to repeat and a liberating one, but on two different ones, the level of the viewer and the level of the performer. There are basically two films which are simul simultaneously proceeding. The individual inner films of the viewers in which they are confronted with their ab abysmal associations, with the continued eff effects of a traumatic history. And there's the real film of the artist 
where it turns out that objectively nothing really happened while the artist was running empty. And thereby, Elana also demonstrates that empty rituals are not necessarily empty, that rituals perhaps become empty only as long as they are not empty enough. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Markus Köhlen. I'm, uh, I'm working as a psychoanalyst in Berlin and uh, in New York. And um, the position of the analyst in relation to artwork is a very complicated one, a very uncomfortable one, actually, because one risks of slipping into an interpretation. Um, and we all know the terrible and uh, somewhat uh, annoying interpretation psychoanalysis can give of literature or artworks. Um, but I think the relation is exactly reversed. I think a psychoanalysis that has to uh, learn from uh, art or from works. Famously, Freud said that the artists are way ahead of us. Um, and with all what happened in the 20th century and what separates us from the time in which Freud uh, formulated this sentence and with uh, your work present, um, I'm not so sure anymore whether the artist is really ahead of us, is maybe running ahead of us, it's running away from us, and we cannot uh, catch her anymore. I think the relation between art and psychoanalysis is one of dissociation, and I think we have to think this dissociation and this impossibility of grasping what is what is running away from us, what is slipping away from us um, in the work, or with the work, or thanks to the work. Um, so I would like to emphasize um, something of the order of separation, of division, of disjunction, of lack of synthesis. Um, and I have to voice my aversion uh, to the term trauma. Uh, I have, I cannot say it differently, it's a bit crude, but um, it's also in the vocabulary that we are using. I have erased it from my vocabulary uh, in clinical work um, and also in theoretical work. Not completely, obviously, because I'm using it, uh, I'm quoting it, and I'm, I'm very inspired by what you said about the ritual of repetition and the strategy of emptying out through repetition uh, terms that uh, have not and have not been emptied out enough, maybe, because of their uh, not having been uh, 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 repeated enough. But I think we have come uh, to a breaking point uh, with the notion of trauma. I think it has emptied itself out uh, in a bad sense. I mean, I speak from my clinical experience. Every time uh, both the notion of trauma occurs, but also something of already conceptualized as trauma, my ear is closed and I, I, can't, uh, I can't do anything against the reflex because it's a manifestation of consciousness. And what I'm listening to, what I'm trying to listen to, what I try to feel, or what I try to hear, maybe not in the session, but in the break when the patient leaves, for instance, or just before he or she comes, is the unconscious. Uh, and the unconscious has taken, since the events of the 20th century, certainly a different form. Uh, it is no longer that which might occur in consciousness, it's that which occurs maybe in the gaps of collective work. And this is why I think it's very important to have several voices speak here, uh, not exactly at the same time, but uh, almost at the same time, at the same place. Like we have several images at the same time. Um, um, we have three images and we have six that are not there, uh, potentially there as uh, uh, indicated by, by the space and constantly being filled in uh, with what you call the inner, the inner uh, film. And I think this is the dimension of the work. Somehow there is no manifestation of memory, I think. It's not, uh, you already said it conceptually what I'm going to repeat. It's my, it was exactly my, my feeling of uh, watching the movie artificially suspending the knowledge I had, dissociating what I knew and just watching it. 
uh, as if I could do that, which of course is an artificial construction because I knew what the conceptual framework was. And I must say, again, it might sound crude, I enjoyed watching it. There was a lot of textuality, <coughs> there was a lot of sensuality. It's not without eroticism. It's vital, as you said. It's the creation of something uncanny of the order of a life form, which does not come to its fruition, that does not come to its full development. It's something of uh, uh, a creature that is emptied out before even being born. But nevertheless there, nevertheless it is insisting as this running, um, as this running being. And uh, I was remembered of a, of a psychoanalytic author who has been the inspirator for many discourses on trauma, uh, Shando Ferenczi, who wrote in 1915 when he was stationed uh, somewhere uh, in war space. Uh, he was too old to be a soldier and he was a doctor, so they put him in a place to guard and watch the dismembered ones that would come back from the field. And he translated Freud's uh, theory of uh, sexuality into Hungarian and developed a strange speculation of natural history. And he became later, as I said, uh, uh, one of the, those analysts who developed the notion of trauma very prominently. But what he means with trauma is of the order of a catastrophe. This is a concurrent term, actually, in his work. And this is maybe a term one can think about more uh, in relation also to this work than the term trauma um, because I have problems finding the wound and the uh, to healing. I'm like you, I struggle with the whole uh, disposition of these, uh, the images, the terms, and you, you know, you manage to, you know, zigzag through it historically and psychoanalytically I would place the dimension of the work somehow between catastrophe and catastrophe means the collapse of the possibility of distinction between the historical dimension of what we call historical in the sense of human history on the one hand and natural history, the catastrophe, <coughs> the falling out of the body or the falling out of the organism onto the earth or out of the womb or on the ground or on the couch or in tears or in uh, decomposition or into death. The indistinguishability between what we know as symbolic man-made um, history on the one hand and a dimension which is not bio biological but a dimension for which psychoanalysis was invented as the, you know, the, this strange connection and disconnection between um, the work and the terrible work of the humans on the one hand and their being completely subjected uh, to nature uh, on the other hand. Catastrophe would be a, a term for this. Um, and on the other hand, there is no healing. This is why I'm struggling also with trauma, because there is a, a discourse of the promise of healing that comes with the notion of trauma, uh, which I find very incompatible with uh, the chances one has in clinical work and psychoanalysis. Uh, so I'm in search for the term that would, in this <coughs> analogy between trauma and healing, uh, be uh, next to catastrophe in this empty space. Uh, and I'm very happy to have seen six empty spaces here, because uh, there's a lot of space for, uh, um, for these inventions that, that I think uh, are necessary. And this is, you know, so I don't have to teach you anything. I am just, you know, keep learning that the gap is wide open. psychotherapist and also the director of Still Point Spaces over in London. Um, when we discussed how we would structure today, which I probably should have said at the beginning rather than at this point, <laughs> is that, that each of the three here would have something to say for about 20 minutes and then I would magically come up with a series of themes to feed back to them um, that were resonant amongst each other and then we'd have a little conversation and then open it up to the audience. Um, it was a rather um, 
inflated and narcissistic task to think that I could, I could do that well, and I've been scribbling away. You may have seen a series of themes. So I'm going to free associate a little bit, um, and then offer those free associations back, which I hope will resonate across all three of you. Um, just some of, the, some of the concepts that arose that, that opened up something for me was this, this idea about e erased history, which provoked questions around, well, who erased it? Was it, was it politically erased or personally erased, or was it, was it a defensive erasure, in a sense, purposeful or unconsciously defensive? Um, ideas of psychogeography, trauma, and against trauma, catastrophe. Um, witness came up quite a bit. We all became implicated as witnesses to something, um, which I think is also quite interesting. Reactivation. Um, the aesthetics, aesthetics of technology on one hand, breath, suffocation, um, memory again and again, the process of memory, what is memory, whose memory, and who's producing the narrative. And then we have ideas of narrative, and we have ideas of interpretation <coughs> of narratives, which made me think of the distinction between content and process. So we have a content narrative of the, the historical story, and then we have some kind of undigested experience, um, which some will think of as trauma, and I think you have a different, different perspective on that. It struck me also in the, in the imagery that we're talking about the lesser known pieces of the Holocaust, in a sense. We have, we have inherited stories of Poland and Germany and camps and trains, but not so much the vans. So there's also a piece of the, the known history that gets erased in that. What made me interested, and I'm going to finish in just a second, but what made me interested is, is the responses. So we have your experience a lot, and then we have these responses which come from both a trying to understand and also an acknowledgement of that unconscious, ungraspable part. Um, and I, I'm thinking of the relational paper by Jessica Benjamin called uh, Beyond Doer and Done To. And what happens when you get past this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I thought your, your, your history was very interesting in that. You know, first it's forgotten, and then it's brought back, and then it's preserved. Um, but is that a dyadic back and forth thing? And is there something about this presentation that goes beyond doer and done to? It doesn't, it doesn't address either. It just, it just happens there. Um, my hope is that that's a kind of a working through that comes in laterally, rather than engaging directly with the material, which speaks to process for me. So that's a kind of confused rain shower of um, themes, and I wonder uh, if either of you either want to respond to some of those, respond to each other, or if there's something that emerged from your own experience of listening to each other that has nothing to do with what I've just said that you would like to, to speak about. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Do you guys think that art is an expression of the unconscious? <laughs> Because if art is an expression of the unconscious, I think it's a production of the unconscious. Well, it throws the unconscious outside, mm -hmm. which does not mean that it was there before. But the unconscious, the unconscious can be there without its production. So I think art forces something that is at the heart of the. Uh, paradoxical or even apparatic logic of the unconscious that it is not where it is so it's being produced as if it were an invention but once it is invented you can only think of it as having been there before so and, and this is what you have to maintain in, in the clinical work constantly hmm. and I think the art does that in forms that are faster different, more sensual, um, less conceptual, more conceptual than, than, than what uh, analytic work struggles with. So it kind of, I always feel, especially uh, an, incredible, an incredibly strong work uh, like yours, kind of gives a strange body to the disincarnated unconscious. Yeah, it produces okay. somehow an amoebae-like creature that you know kind of moves in space and allows to to 
to, to touch on something of the unconscious, which mm -hmm. in, in, in the analytic work one is not able to do in the same way, mm -hmm. but which nourishes the analytic work. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is how I feel also, <laughs> is that I feel like I, I learn something about my unconscious through my work or my, okay, I'm also in psychotherapy, you know, <laughs> psychoanalysis. And, um, and I, I would even say, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, but I would say you make your unconscious, you produce your unconscious, you create your unconscious. It's not in the, in the production of artwork, yes. I mean, yeah, yeah, but oftentimes it happens without having any idea what you're doing, you exactly. know, so it's, it, it can be intellectualized and understood maybe later, but, um, but I think that it can just sort of be this, like, expression of something that actually has a huge meaning that you don't understand until later, you know, so that this is why for some reason the word production doesn't sound quite fitting to me because it can be something that's produced just out of intuition that you have no idea what you're doing actually, you know. And so uh, with, with that idea is, um, is, is actually why I would, uh, how I would think about these um, comments that you guys have made that it's not uh, compulsive repetition or that there is no memory, or that there is no trauma, or you know what I mean? Because actually, it can be. Do you know? Um, um, it can be a, a kind of unconscious manifestation of it through the work. You know, it can be actually. Um, for example, I will give one example in case this is not clear. Uh, I'm very attracted to this aesthetic of lines, you know, and I have this, like, this lines. And um, I, when I was very affected by doing this very intense work in the Balkans, especially working with, okay, landscapes of trauma, like I said, but also in the midst of an ethnic conflict working between uh, Belgrade and Pristina, and feeling sort of ripped apart by the two sides, and I, I created a work where I carved a barcode into my chest with a razor blade. And the marks are still there forever, they're part of me. <laughs> um, but I, the, the concept of the work that I could in intellectually grasp was um, that I'm turning my body into a landscape of trauma that is reflecting, it's a canvas that's reflecting the, ge the geographical ones surrounding me that I'm working with. But I never knew why it was a barcode. And I, a lot of people asked me, why was it a barcode? And I always just would say, well, I don't know. It was, it was an intuition. And for some reason, I thought, OK, that's enough. But I really didn't understand why I was doing it. And then recently, it kind of occurred to me, aha, lines. Um, trauma is actually all about lines, because uh, lines are borders. And trauma is all about borders being crossed. And when the, the border is crossed into, you know, what is abuse or so forth, or, you know. And, um, and so uh, how absolutely appropriate that I had this really strong, um, forceful intuition that it had to be a barcode that was carved into my chest of a series of lines of blood <laughs> um, to reflect to make my body a reflection of a landscape of trauma, you know? And so it's just, uh, yeah, this example of like, mm, the creative intuition can reveal something that you didn't know was there, mm -hmm. you know? There's a, there's a great expression in psychoanalysis called a, a negative capability. Negative capability is capacity to kind of sit, sit with and allow it to happen in a sense. And I feel I don't feel that art in psychoanalysis are, are too antithetical, and it feels like that moment of making the lines and not knowing what the lines are, and being able to sit with not knowing what the lines are, maybe for quite some time, mm -hmm. is not dissimilar from the surrender one offers in a psychotherapy session of not understanding mm -hmm. the material for some time and being able to bear that, the, surrendering oneself to it or surrendering both of you to it. And then maybe you come upon an answer, in a sense, like you have, but then maybe, maybe that answer would change for you at some point in the future. You know, maybe lines, yeah. it's lines now. Yeah. But I'm, I'm not sure if it has to have that, um, 
core meaning in a sense. Yeah. You know, maybe it, maybe it, maybe it will for you. It's your experience. It's not mine. But that you might find that there's something in co-ed about the experience. Then you come upon an explanation, mm -hmm. like a piece of art. You might feel differently about this one in ten years' time. You know? Yeah. And from what, uh, and in reading a lot about memory these days, I, I mean, the idea that speaks to me a lot is that memory is in this constant reconstructive process. Is that, but that's completely not what we're taught when we're growing up or something. It's like it's set in stone and history is official and written, but it's in a constant uh, process of mm, being, yeah, existing through different filters or selecting or changing or adding or deleting and I like the idea, what speaks to me is the idea that it's all done in this process for, to, of survival, for the purpose of survival, you know. But I, I know that those are like debatable um, ideas, but these are the ones that I'm... That is a woman in the back. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your, your work and your, your talks. I have a basic problem with yeah with putting um, like considering the German guilt the collective guilt as a trauma. I mean, there's a big discussion about how guilt can be traumatic, and I would definitely question this or even say it's not the case. It's completely different concepts, and running away from guilt is something completely different than running away from a trauma. So I find this very problematic as we take it as the same, which I think is definitely not and as many. There have been many studies made that guilt can be traumatic, especially for the Nazi perpetrators and stuff. So I would like to bring this in the discussion to, to make this very <coughs> important distinction in, in order for the work, because it makes such a difference for what, what, why she's running or what she's running away from. So I find that a bit problematic. Can I? Uh, Yes. Um, and this, your your question um, um, points to one of the places from which I'm, I'm I'm I have a problem with the term trauma. I'm I'm sorry. I don't. I find it I find it outrageous to to call yourself traumatized by being shown pictures of concentration camps. I think it's completely it's psychologically, historically, politically uh, wrong. I think it's not a precise use of the term trauma. Um, is certainly terrible or injuring or narcissistic, uh, <coughs> difficult to bear, but it's not a traumatization. The traumatization is a disruption of the very structure <coughs> that has been there before, <coughs> or we call it psychic structure. It's a, it's a, it's a disruption of the structure uh, that was in place before this event happened, which will never be recapitulated. You will never, with memory or work, come back to the place when, where you were before this trauma <coughs> happened. This is why it insists, you know, this is why it has to do uh, uh, with the other, with running, with uh, strange sounds, <coughs> with strange images, with this junction. There is no healing from <coughs> trauma. Um, so, so you have an notion of trauma. The notion of trauma is, I, I would say, you know, a notion of trauma, if you really want to make it hurtful also, you know, it makes you think, it makes you also work clinically, then it is the impossibility of memory, of repetition, and of working through. It's that which insists, despite all the possibilities of imagining, uh, of coming back to a time or a space that was before or outside of this traumatization. So this is why art is important, because it throws it out there. This is a piece of trauma. But we don't know this trauma. It's a, it's a traumatization for an other, which is also important. The trauma is <coughs> and I think the appropriation of the Germans of the term trauma is outrageous. It's completely outrageous. I, I find it. And already the sorry the term or outrageous is it already a kind of psychic? <coughs> I mean, there's something here going on. No? Yeah, I think I, 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 think I have a notion. I think yeah. I have an aversion to it. I find it, I find it politically extremely. Uh, I find it unacceptable to construct an entity that is called the German nation that was traumatized. No, I'm not sure whether this is what Alada Asman said. It. She must um, if she draws the conclusion of what she she's saying. But she connected with uh, this trauma. Yeah, no, 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 no. But you can't say one thing and then say not the next. There's a logical 
continuation. You say, I'm traumatized, you pose yourself as an organism. Otherwise, you're not traumatized. You just, you know, it's, uh, trauma, uh, trauma is, a, is a, a fundamental wound to an organism. So if you say the German nation was traumatized, you pose necessarily the German nation as an organism, which is the last thing you want to do. So, you know, the, the, the trauma comes with a whole set of consequences which are extremely uh, problematic or that just not thought through, you know, they're just, you know, kept under the table. Can I ask, so, I mean, would you consider that on the Jewish side, that, that is that a traumatized group, then is it different, do you consider it different if you look at this? Individuals, families, yes, have been terribly traumatized, of course. Okay, but then in later generations or something, or... It's a, it's a question of specific cases. Yeah. This is another problem. You can never, in psychoanalysis, you can never generalize. It's always, this is one of the traumatic dimensions then that, of psychoanalysis. That would also be for the German nation not to be able to <laughs> generalize. I don't, I don't know what that is, the German nation. Yeah, oh well. I want to I make sure that we get some other things yes, in, so I think we could go on about yeah, this, but I see some other hands, and I would like to bring them in. Yes? I just have um, kind of a question. you adopted this um, memory or this event. And then, yeah, it's just like, I'm very curious because um, of how maybe adopting a memory can allow us to have permission to just do our biological impulses. So when I was watching the film, I was thinking, you know, like, I would be really into the film even if you had just said, I really felt like I just needed this physical catharsis of running for 15 kilometers and it was so random and I had no explanation for that and somehow there's like, because it's attached to this trauma, this isn't just, I mean I think I see it in myself and I see it in a lot of people, there's this idea of like, if I can attach a random impulse within myself to something, I have permission. and so. Memory becomes really, I don't know, these things become important to give us permission to, to kind of do these physical acts that would otherwise be random or incoherent. And I think art is a really interesting place because it allows us to um, be incoherent while maintaining a sense of coherence at the same time. And I'm really interested in, like, you as the artist. I mean, I was waiting for this for weeks to come see it. I was really excited. <laughs> watching it and as I was watching it I was kind of going watching it always with like two brains of like I think I'm just watching a girl who wants to like or a woman who wants to run and I'm really into that. And then I was thinking, yeah, I would think, um, you know, and then I would think, oh okay, but there's also this historical narrative and I was thinking like maybe that's really, really important because without that memory this woman would have, would have the galvanizing force to allow her to run and convince, like, the, you know, like if you were to go say to a sound editor and a film producer and, or, you know, I want to make this film if I just want to run 15 kilometers with no training and see what happens, like, would people maybe not support you, but if you can adopt a memory, will they support you? And if, I'm not making a, a position either way. I'm just really curious to hear more about you as the artist and maybe like, I don't know, this is just for discussion. So that's what yeah. I was thinking of when I was watching it and I really, really enjoyed it. Thank so, you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah, but it, just to kind of what I was saying before about the intuition, sometimes there is like the need to make a work that I don't fully understand, but um, I still make it. And then I often will understand it in retrospect, you know. How would you feel about making a work if it wasn't attached to like a, a, a bit like the border, like you're talking about the importance of lines and the way that trauma can like, kind of delineate a space yeah. But would it be like you think, I'm just curious in people's like creative process, if you didn't have that order or boundary of trauma to work with, with performance? Do you think people well, would 
Well, I always have different. I always have different, like different contexts, and, and I work with different topics. And sometimes it's very abstract, and sometimes it's very literal with sights. But sometimes it's completely, yeah, working only with the body, or working doing pieces that are in like a white cube environment, or this kind of thing. So it's always adjustable, you know. Can I, can I just throw something in? Because I think there's something very interesting about the, the mobility of memory in, in a sense, who, 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 who gets to own a memory yeah. or who gets yeah. to use a memory. And just a, a very small self-revelation. I'm Jewish also and I grew up, I just grew up with the Holocaust. Um, we just had it, you know, we just learned about it all the time. And I remember asking my mother when I was about 15 years old about how, you know, my grandmother had, when she came over when the Holocaust happened, she said, oh, they weren't in the Holocaust, they were in the pogroms. And I didn't have a story for the pogroms. I thought that Jews had the Holocaust, right? And suddenly I found out that uh, the, the family history that I thought we owned as a, as, as our, a people, because that's what I've been learning in Hebrew school, was my story. And at 15, I find out there's a whole other story. And I think this, this speaks to your, what you're talking about, trauma, that if, if there's transgenerational trauma in my family, it's nothing to do with the Holocaust. It has to do with the pogroms. But that's if that's in the family. <laughs> But then how it would be expressed in me could be completely misread unless I had that kind of correction. So I just think it's, it's interesting, and to your question in the back too, you know, a national story, a national narrative becomes this mobile thing that people can attach all sorts of interesting consequences to. And I think you said I just, it's adopted memory was just an interesting way of thinking about yeah. how we all access different kinds of memory yeah. Yeah. and then what that meaning has. When it gives us permission, I think I'm really interested in it. so biologically appealing about it and this kind of restful about hearing your um, your vital rhythms, the rhythms of your muscles and your lungs and your diaphragm um, that's uh, valid in its own right and then it's so that's so kind of um, openly put together with this like, like adopted memory um, which is much more intellectual and kind of mm -hmm. premeditated so, yeah, it's how those two intersect to create mm -hmm. like, permission or something that's going to be interesting. There were, there yeah, were a couple I of hands. Um, oh. well, maybe we get a couple of comments at, at, at once and then we see what we can respond to. Um, why don't you go and then the gentleman in the back? And was there one more? Just the two? Three. Okay, so you in the white, you in the back, and then you in the front if you want to offer your question or, or comment. So I'm actually quite amazed that you, you clearly knew what the film was about and you said you were looking forward to seeing it. Um, and I have the exact opposite response because I mean, I knew I wanted to see it very much because I'm familiar with Ilana's work and my lovely boyfriend did the song. So, but um, as somebody who was in a different life as well with literature and this precise topic, um, I knew that I was comfortable working with words and the representation of the Holocaust of what, you know, in that particular debate of representation and the whether it's even possible to represent something is known as trauma. Um, so I knew I was quite comfortable with that in, in words, but I was really wondering what it would feel like to actually see somebody feel it physically. Um, and by that I'm not suggesting that she's actually, you know, feeling the, you know, the original content of the experience, but she's going through the, um, she's going through something that um, approximates it in that performance. And something that in literature we often talk about is the insufficiency of words in conveying trauma, and that at best we can sort of circle the void, the demarcation lines of what trauma is, because trauma itself, in, in that particular debate in literature, that, you know, um, history as well, is um, that trauma is the thing that you cannot grasp. It's, it's that complete disruption which then it brings it back to actual clinical use of the term. So I think it's two different dimensions in using it, really. Um, and I find it really interesting that you shift the de demarcation lines of what we can talk about and what we can grasp in terms of trauma. 
Because saying, for example, that um, a gas van ran 15 kilometers or trying to sort of flesh it out in words and descriptions and metaphors is one thing. But you're actually running 50 kilometers and we're hearing you breathe through it and we're seeing your exhaustion. Um, and you bring it back into this sort of, in, into the space where it was happening, um, which renders it very, very immediate and I think to me certainly reduces um, the impact of a filter that words would have. So it just it gave me a different different way of looking at your at, um, at this history and the landscape that brings it to life. And the way I, I read your body was um, as an instrument. And I'm I'm not saying <coughs> it's an instrument in, in terms of a musical instrument, although you certainly you know played with the sounds that you played. <laughs> but an instrument that measures, um, that discerns, that parses, you know, the lines of it, that parses the experiences that are obliquely present in this space, that, you know, are maybe only there traces that, you know, we would have to know about to find. Um, and um, in that I also want to just come back to what you said about the cables that you've attached to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, that really sort of uh, reinforced that idea of the body as instrument and you know, maybe attempting a different representation of trauma, um, because what you're what you're doing is you're really visually showing your a body as something that measures, that is measured. Um, you know, sort of the instrument of of modernism as it is. You know, the context in which the Holocaust happened. If anybody's familiar with Adorno, which I assume most people are, um, you know, the sort of dialectic of the Enlightenment being that, on the one hand. Um, Modernity can give us, uh, you know, ways, useful ways of categorizing things in science, but it can also turn the other way. And the drive to measure, to categorize, can also lead to genocide. Mm -hmm. So, um, I find that just an interesting sort of meta comment <coughs> on, on the general thing. Um, yeah. In any case, yes, I will, I will stop talking about it, but <laughs> I'm really, really glad to have seen it, even though I was sort of dreading it, because I, I wasn't sure what impact it would have on me because I knew I wouldn't have that distance. And yeah, and I'm glad that you feel it this way, that it's sort of, that it's, uh, you said something about it's going where words can't or something like yeah. this. And that's exactly how I feel too. <laughs> yeah, we and it's difficult, yes, yeah. yeah, and we've had this discussion before, but it's like, it's, uh, it's also as it were, uh, language is a medium I'm not very comfortable with and it's difficult for me to like, sit here and talk about this and to feel as though that, that any words that I can find, I don't feel that any words can actually cap, grasp, you know, what's going on or what happened or, you know, but um, I'm glad if what I cannot say can be captured in the work. Would you say it yeah. gets catch, captured in images? You would say that either, no? There's something that has a lot to do with the sound and the music yes. and the, the musicality of the piece itself. It's not yeah. images either. It's well, not it's, music all either. It. it's all of it. It's all of it. It's the experience, first of all, which is none of, you know, it doesn't even involve like the, the post production. Um, but then, yes, then it's the working with imagery, and for sure, what happened with the sound is enormous. You know, the sound. It's also interesting, like uh, you were pointing out, that because uh, Dario saw some of the earlier pieces of the project, and the video was silent, and um, and then you were saying, ah, this is another layer of erased history, actually, that you're erasing the sound even of the of the action, and I think that it's true, actually. Like I've never collaborated with somebody working with sound. Um, and I think that the use of sound in the piece really completes it and adds this layer that is very, very intense. And I like it also that the project finishes with that because it shows like the, such a development from the time when I started this seven years ago, like it reached a sort of maturity or something. Yeah. So there was the guy in the young person um, yeah, this is for Alana, um, right, Alana? Yes. Yeah, um, well, I thought it was particularly interesting um, the way that you're, the way that you described your artistic process in making this film kind of reflects the recovery process of, uh, like, recovering from developmental or trauma or post-traumatic stress, in that, um, 
basically like, and also talking about memory, like traumatic memory is often fragmented and image-based as opposed to narrative-based. And in, re in recovering from trauma, the challenge of the clinician is to kind of help somebody create a narrative of their trauma so that they can then integrate that trauma into the past, basically, and get over it. And I thought, um, so you know, you saying that you kind of had this impulse to, uh, you know, the, your artistic process is having impulses that you don't completely understand, and then you kind of like let them out and then see what happens. That kind of reflects this image-based memory that's yeah. nonsensical. So I thought that was really interesting. Mm, yeah. Um, and so um, then my question is basically like, since you have done this project, what are your, or have you had any retrospective realizations that you were saying, like the one that you had <laughs> in your chest? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Suffice it to say, it was a very personal experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's my question or comment is connected to what you were saying about uh, representation or the impossibility of representation of Holocaust or basically violent experiences. And as this essay by uh, <coughs> Jean Montpensier in the ground of the image, where he describes that it's actually impossible to like reenact or something like that, but there, there might, but still there's a way to express this. And um, then I connected your comment about uh, thesis and antithesis, and then the impossibility of uh, synthesis is moving away from this representational framework of uh, Hegelian framework and finding a way to um, express something here that we actually cannot see in the images. And that happened, I think, through the formal way they structured the work. And the, you kind of uh, were talking about six squares, the six images that are missing. All the, basically, we see all the time only 11 to 22 percent of the, is the screen filled with, um, with the content of the information. Yeah. So we are exposed like all the time to something that isn't there, that isn't actually representative. Mm -hmm. This is what I think that really works within, within the work on the formal level. Mm. And then connected to technology and mics and everything, it's also uh, points out the, to the other one aspect of the Holocaust, why it could work the way it worked, is the technology and this association of uh, culpability or responsibility through the technology. Because if you look at the, you know, like uh, moving uh, gas chamber is like kind of a technological improvement of the one that doesn't move. So you have this kind of uh, a detachment of, the, of who is doing this through, through this, okay, this is the thing, this is how it works, but there's no like human, uh, uh, somehow the agency, the human agency has been um, suspended. <coughs> Mm. So in order for this to work, and this technological that you are showing is, is making this yeah. connection to that. that mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Maybe this is actually what the reason why I like the robotic aesthetic. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think we'll take we'll take one more question and then we're out of time. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm very interested in this like analysis uh, aspect of this work. I kind of agree with you that you said uh, this work is not really a question about recalling the trauma because as far as we <coughs> know through the pathway and your explanation, you have no direct experience about with the uh, Holocaust and this guest chapter and uh, I mean not a family member, not yourself, you are not directly um, connected to this experience. For me it's more about um, relieving the, uh, the pain of others, you know, like the people who <laughs> suffer through these 15 kilometers till they actually lose their life, you kind of, through this act of running, <coughs> you can relieve the pain that people actually, the experience that they went through 
through this uh, distance. So for me, it's like, when I look at it, it's kind of like a masochistic action too, because it's a, you said that you have no train, so it's like a very far distance. Uh, so kind of you put your physical, bodily uh, capability into question, you know, you push your limits. So for me, it's kind of like a, I don't know if it's the right term or not, but I feel like it's a kind of masochistic act that you push yourself physically, uh, considering that what you said about the other project that you use actually result with. So I'm kind of interested to, mm -hmm. from everyone to hear about this, uh, this aspect of the work. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of, um, in a lot of performances that I do, basically in everything that I do, well, yeah, but no, a lot. What's really important is pushing um, the limitations of the body and of the mind and finding out where are one's borders and oftentimes like you actually have much more strength or capacity than you're even capable of uh, than you realize you know you're capable of so much more than you realize um, but actually pushing oneself to the limits and then finding out what lies on the other side is something that's really powerful in durational performance work. And this is a term in the performance art world is durational performance, which is where you push these you know, capacities. And um, yeah, because finding out what lies on the other side and using the body as an instrument in this way, it can be really transformational, you know, for, like for the performer, but also for the for those who are interacting with it. And just about this idea of, I mean, the reason why I keep t uh, repeating post-memory is exactly because it's this idea of learned memories, you know? And um, like, I, I mean, I am, I am a Jew and I did have some family involved in the Holocaust. I don't really think it's that relevant, but yeah, there is this. But I certainly am frustrated by also being like labeled a Jewish artist making work about the Holocaust because this is really That's a human topic. <laughs> yeah, um, but um, this is uh, yeah with with learned with like these memories that can be learned also through generations. Traumas. I mean, I, I'm sorry to keep saying it, but it's traumatic <laughs> memories, for example, in Jewish families that are like. So you learn it through the generations, and it is assimilated, and 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 and. But this is uh, this is a question. Actually, I even wanted to ask you from the beginning, but then we got to so many other topics. Is really that because memory is this reconstructive process? Is like when can one even differentiate sometimes when it's post memory or real memory? You know. And, and in the experience of psychoanalysis, when you're looking at you know, early childhood or analyzing dreams or something, it often becomes so blurry. You don't know where is real memory or where is an assimilated one or what was the word, an adopted one, somebody else said, um, or, or happening in the realm of sleep. Or, all of these things are so slippery, actually. And as an artist, I find it actually interesting to work with this slipperiness. Not to necessarily go for precision, but just to work about the ambiguity and of this, you know? I, I think we are very ill-equipped for truth. Our first uh, perception is hallucination. So this is why we're obsessed with truth and the construction of props that allow us to speak of something that is beyond the narcissistic, imminent, hallucinatory, contained, um, primordial process of which we will never get out of. And I think what you do is, uh, um, a term that came to mind of in the, this exchange is, um, is elasticity, which mm -hmm. is an image or a term for the drive. You know, we think of the drive more as a force or a push, as something that pushes forward. But you might think of the drive if you keep this somehow, this substance that is not biological but somehow interwoven with everything that is the organism. If you think of the drive as elasticity and the testing of elasticity, you come to something that is, I think, again, is uh, similar between artwork and clinical experience. What you do is you, you try to stretch as much as possible an elastic material to the point it might break, but it, then it doesn't, because or it, it continues does. somewhere, or it does, yeah. yeah, and then it's picked up somewhere else, but this fragmented, rubbery, elastic, elast uh, elasticity is, is, a, <coughs> is a strong image for 
for what we call the drive. And then it's no longer a question whether it's inside or outside, whether it's organic or not organic, because it's in the manifestation of itself yeah. itself. And it needs many. It's never an individual process. It needs, needs many. And it messes up all the categories between images and not images, and words, not words, truth, fiction. It becomes its own thing. And that's, I think this is where you push us to. Where it becomes unbearable. I agree with you. The combination of the pleasure of running with the reenactment of trauma is scandalous. It's a kind of you know, it's a kind of enjoyment that is hard to bear. And but I mean that's that's the <laughs> that's where it goes to the to the maybe something traumatic, maybe something hurtful, maybe something unbearable. Well, I'm afraid we're we're beyond that time. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I just thought I wanted to give you a chance if you had any final thoughts. I know that a thought actually, but a question, um, because I, <laughs> <laughs> I underlined the importance of the title and now yeah. it was curious, is it, is it your title or how did it come, um, how did it? Yeah, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> and I found out that there's, I found out that there's a song, also there's a rock song from the 70s called Running on Empty, yeah, yeah. Really, so I decided this guy has a new music video. <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> um, a big thank you to our artists and our panelists. Thank you very much. And I think we need thank to get